According to the Oxford University World Christian Encyclopedia, there are in excess of 30,000 distinct Christian groups and denominations in the world today, with more being added all the time and some dying out as we speak. Now, by way of comparison, when you watch the uh, NBA Finals return to Cleveland at the queue, the seating capacity of the queue is somewhat in excess of 20,000 seats. Every man, woman, and child that you will see in that stadium could represent a Christian denomination or group uh, with 10,000 besides. That's a lot of Christian denominations. The church in Aurora is a non-denominational church and doesn't belong to any of them. Uh, some of them are quite exclusive, claiming possession of the truth to the exclusion of all others. We don't think they can all be right. We think we're right. Actually, the truth in the community churches believes that God, in his wisdom, has created a rich diversity, a myriad of faith traditions... Um, and that he has a history of working that way. In the Bible, for example, there's not just one gospel story of Jesus. There are four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And frankly, they don't always conform to one another as it comes to the minutiae of details about Jesus' life. There are a gazillion translations of the Bible, and we who do not speak Hebrew or Greek or read or write it can be Glad that there are a great variety of translations. In the same way, God in his wisdom has provided a great variety of religious expression so that there is a house of worship that can feel like home for each of God's children. It is in this vein that Paul, in several places, speaks of, quote, my gospel, he calls it. In fact, in our Benediction to today's service, we'll, we'll recount one of those texts. My gospel. He doesn't mean that uh, he possesses the gospel or that his take on the gospel is the only possible one. Quite to the contrary, Paul turns out to be a very inclusive member of the faith tradition. He, he was the one that opened the doors to the Gentiles in the beginning, uh, where some, his own faith tradition was rather exclusive. What Paul means when he calls it my gospel is to say that this is how the gospel has been uniquely embodied in my life. This is how it uniquely reached me. In Paul's case, the gospel came to him in a, in a very unique fashion. He reminds the Galatian hearers in our text, You have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God, and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Now, Paul was uh, born and raised in the Jewish faith tradition, and he was what you might call a, a, a fanatic, a religious fanatic. He, he memorized the scriptures over and over. He uh, was advancing uh, way ahead of his class, in his study of his faith tradition. He was so fanatic that when a new faith tradition began to develop called Christianity, uh, he was very threatened by it. He considered them infidels. He decided, he presumed, to protect God from the infidel uh, by persecuting the church terribly. In fact, he was egging on the crowd that stoned to death the first Christian martyr after Jesus, a guy named Stephen after whom our Stephen ministry is named. Well, Paul was there telling people, pick up stones, throw them at him. Uh, he, the church that was scattered because of that persecution, he continued to hound. He tracked them down to throw Christians into prison, leaving their children parentless. He uh, confiscated their property. He was a terrible persecutor of the church until he was on the road to Damascus. And God decided, to, the Lord decided to have a moment with him in a blinding light. He realized how blind he had been. He had been doing ungodly things in God's name. 
Now, you, we might wonder why the Lord didn't just eliminate him from the equation then and there, but the Lord had plans for Paul. Paul recounted those in a letter to Timothy. He said, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy statement that is worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Yes, Paul's path to faith was uniquely his own, but God in his wisdom chose Paul as an example for us all. We may think, well, I, I, I've stepped over the line and I'm no longer worthy to be a child of God. Listen, you haven't done half as much as Paul did. That violent persecutor of the church, the worst of sinners, that, that arrogant and self-righteous and judgmental bully of the faith of his fathers. Now, if God can use the likes of the worst of sinners, he can use the likes of us, and he will reach us if we are open to it, and sometimes even if we are not. Our confirmation class here has been fashioned by the gospel. They are sons and daughters of the church. Uh, that is a fact about you now that cannot be changed. It's an interesting fact. People will notice that when you go on to graduate from high school, maybe go to college or into the military. There are going to be roommates in college. There will be soldiers in barracks who are going to find that out about you. You might try to keep it a secret, but it will sneak out somewhere. And then they're going to be intensely interested. Oh, you were raised in the church. Not everybody in our culture is raised in the church. All they know about the church is what they see on TV. Are you like them? Some people will respond to that fact with outright derision. Well, that's a bunch of baloney, they'll say. And now and others are kind of intrigued by it, and I've got to admit that I had some girlfriends along the way that were rather interested. Oh, really? What's that like? Are you a fanatic? Or, you know, they, they wonder. They're kind of curious about it. But this is who you are, and you cannot change that fact about your upbringing. You can deny the faith, but you cannot deny the fundamental fact of how you have been raised as a son and daughter of the faith. And one other thing you can be sure of. People are going to be watching you. Uh, even the ones who deride you are going to be watching. Has this faith fashioned you for better or for worse? They're not going to be watching whether you sneak scriptures into your textbook so you can read them on the sly or whether you pray all the time. But they're going to be watching how you treat God's other children who are different than you, who are different color, a different creed, uh, different socioeconomic background. You regard each and all as a child of God. Do you treat them with respect? Do you treat yourself with respect? Do you pollute your body? Do you succumb to destructive, self-destructive compulsions? Do you surrender to defeat whenever life throws you a challenge? Or is there some core in you, something in you that helps you pick yourself up and go forward? They're going to be watching you because they are struggling with the same issues, and they are, whether they like it or not, creatures of faith. People are, excuse me, spiritual beings. They're struggling. Does your faith make a difference? Does it help? Does it save you from life's pitfalls and snares? Does it help you to see a better way? They'll be watching. 
The most beautiful story was given to all, written down a long time ago, by Matthew and Mark, by Luke and by John. It is the story of Jesus, you know. It is a wonderful story, that gospel of love, revealed in Christ's life so divine. And oh, that its truth might be told yet again in the story of your life and mine. You are writing each moment a letter to all. Take care that the writing is true. It's the only gospel some people will read. It's the gospel according to you. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that you do, by the words that you say. Others read what you write and they watch carefully to say, what is the gospel according to you? Please rise.